Distinguished participants, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, an honor and privilege to uh, really address such a distinguished gathering. And uh, I am grateful to the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation for having uh, me as a keynote speaker today. And I hope that during our uh, meeting today, after I make some preliminary remarks, uh, I will open the floor for questions so that it wouldn't be just from me to you, but I would also learn the, uh, the pulse here from, from your questions and we can make it a two-way traffic uh, so that we can understand <coughs> some of the views on, on difficult issues. Uh, I think uh, with its uh, noble cause, uh, the uh, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation occupies a well-deserved place at the forefront of the NGOs, and uh, I think uh, it strives to contribute to the welfare of the humankind and the sound development to, of the international community. I think uh, SPF's mission also finds a strong resonance in Turkey, where peaceful resolution of conflicts through dialogue and cooperation has always been a primary objective of foreign policy. Uh, perhaps uh, I have a wonderful uh, uh, speech written for me in this, to be used in this address. But after seeing this wonderful audience, I will perhaps distribute it later on and uh, just uh, try to talk uh, uh, more, more freely. Uh, if we look at the uh, last uh, two decades, or a little bit more, uh, for countries like Turkey and Japan, uh, which, uh, which are prone to earthquakes, I think big earthquakes also happened in the world front, in, in, the, uh, in economies, in political atmosphere. And uh, I think uh, as uh, earthquakes, always have uh, following earthquakes and uh, sometimes to tsunamis. These four earthquakes I will share with you are still with us and uh, the uh, implications, complications are also uh, seen everywhere. I think the first earthquake I would like to share with you has been the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union, the Soviet Empire. Uh, it, was, it was a very difficult uh, transformation because after the Second World War, some leaders of the uh, winners, if I may say so, of the World War came together in Yalta and Potsdam and uh, had a map in front of them and decided uh, for new uh, territories for countries, but also decided for the future of people who are living in those territories. So because of the decision of those leaders, some people went through a horrible communist era for 45 years, while just because of a one or two days decision, the same people uh, from the same ethnicity had to live uh, a more prosperous life in their, in their 45 years uh, period. When you look at the uh, communist era, we're talking about people who didn't have any access to uh, Western uh, life, couldn't carry foreign currency, didn't have uh, the right to travel, didn't have any right to uh, leave their uh, real estates behind or even have any ownership. We, they didn't have law universities in our understandings or uh, commercial uh, uh, universities of commerce uh, in our, in our uh, way of understanding. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, the, the, these countries suddenly become either independent or <coughs> uh, freed from the uh, Soviet uh, system. But those people who didn't know how to live outside the the Soviet or communist aquarium, well, it was very difficult for them. I mean, again, they faced a difficult situation. But I think the world uh, faced 
this situation uh, better than the other three earthquakes I would, I, I'm going to share with you by opening the uh, NATO uh, possibilities and also giving European Union memberships. And this, in a way, uh, gave some security and confidence feeling to the countries and to the people. And uh, I think during the uh, 15 to uh, 10, 15 years, we can say that those countries who became NATO members and EU members are now feeling very comfortable <coughs> more than, more than uh, ever during the uh, f five decades they, they, they lived. But of course, as, the, uh, as I have mentioned in my preliminary statement, earthquakes have following earthquakes and to tsunamis. Now, as the uh, Russian Federation is uh, feeling more stronger and also uh, trying to, uh, in a way, compensate the losses of the Soviet Empire, uh, has now different intentions uh, to uh, recuperate uh, some of the uh, power lost. And we're now facing uh, the situation we are seeing in Ukraine, or we have seen in Georgia, or we will see some, in some other places. So this is one situation. The second earthquake was perhaps the, uh, the uh, terrorist attack uh, to the United States. I think uh, this was, from the uh, experts' uh, point of view, one of the best uh, planned, best fulfilled terrorist attack ever. The 9-11 thing was, I think, a catastrophe for, for the United States, for the world. And it was, I think, it really uh, changed all the uh, beliefs uh, that nothing will happen to the United States, nothing will happen to the Western world. But that particular terrorist attack Actually, one plane hit the economic system, the World Trade Center, two buildings, was the hit to the economic system. The other hit the defense system, the Pentagon. And most probably, the hit plane, the fourth one, was going to hit either the Congress or the White House. So I think this enormous terrorist attack uh, brought us to a different era where we were afraid from terrorism, we were afraid of uh, flying, we were afraid of uh, walking on the streets, we were afraid of uh, doing things we, we freely did previously. And I think this terrorist attack brought new security concepts and it again caused the, uh, the, uh, the countries who were negatively affected or hit and lost lives to counterattack and find some uh, solutions outside their countries. So we had an era where uh, US troops were in Iraq, NATO was here or there in Afghanistan. Some uh, satans uh, were found, like Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, Osama bin Laden, or I mean, because in the United States uh, system. The American people are very nice people, but I, th I think the geography uh, uh, knowledge of the Americans are, are, are not as much as their economic capacities. If you ask somebody in the United States where is Turkey, they, they will sometimes point to Africa, sometimes to Middle East. It's very common. So it is very difficult to convince the American people to send troops abroad as well, to make them say yes for American soldiers to die for the interest of their country. Then it has to be a real reason behind it. So 9-11, in a way, was the reason. And the target, Saddam Hussein, was a reason. Getting rid of Saddam Hussein, getting rid of Gaddafi, getting rid of Osama bin Laden was a reason. So this, when, when these three figures were uh, eliminated, now I think we entered into a situation where 
United States will have a lot of difficulty to send troops abroad to convince the American people that it is necessary for uh, the United States to, uh, to uh, interfere somewhere to save America. Nobody will say yes for the, under the present circumstances to such kind of a demand from the US President or the Congress. So that, of course, brings us to a, another situation, very complex, where without the United States troops anywhere, NATO will be uh, not as strong as, uh, as it was to uh, go into countries, uh, make attacks, uh, to save the uh, uh, Western world, uh, world peace, etc. So there is a complexity there. So then I come to the third earthquake, uh, which was the economic crisis. I think uh, it was one of the worst economic crises we ever saw. When we look at the uh, figures after the economic crisis we had, it is almost similar to the figures we see after the Second World War. That shows how disastrous it was for, for the, especially the Western world. Uh, all the trusted uh, structures uh, suddenly disappearing. Uh, in one month, 500,000 people losing their jobs. Uh, the uh, elements of uh, economic development disappearing, and it, is, it, 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 it affects the European countries. Some countries were caught uh, unprepared. Uh, normally they went bankrupt, but the system couldn't afford bankruptcy of countries, so the others came into the help of, of those countries, etc. But I think this the, uh, the uh, uh, effects of this third earthquake will, uh, will be with us for a while because I think those, some of the countries will never come back to where they were because the, uh, they were in a way built on some structures where some, especially in Europe, uh, some countries have populations who doesn't like to work hard as Japanese or Turkish people. 35 uh, hours a week is sometimes a burden for European citizens and they wouldn't like to work even 35 hours. They get 15 salaries a year instead of 12, 12 salaries and uh, with this kind of a situation it's very difficult to come back to uh, a w welfare state without working and without uh, really making the hard, hard work uh, necessary. Uh, so um, then I come to the fourth earthquake, which was the uh, transformation of leaderships, political transformation in the Middle East. Uh, this was a, a different one because, it, you know, in Japan and in Turkey, we have a lot of earthquake experts. So uh, normally they can say where the earthquake can take place. They will say, okay, exactly here we will have an earthquake. But I haven't seen any earthquake uh, expert saying when the earthquake will take place. They will make some uh, calculations. Some say it will happen six months, in six months. Same place, another expert says it will happen in five years. Same place, another expert says, it won't happen before 30 years. Another expert says, well, sometime in 500 years, we will have an, expert he, uh, uh, an earthquake here. So it's the same situation what happened in the, in the Middle East. We all knew that uh, dictators who uh, really uh, had an oppressive rule in their countries were going to disappear in Egypt, Syria, Libya, many other countries in the Middle East. But as experts uh, for earthquakes uh, couldn't say when, this happened, unfortunately, all together at the same time. We were expecting them to leave one day, but we weren't actually expecting them to leave all together <coughs> as a chain reaction. And this caused, of course, new situations, new uh, understandings, new needs, 
And uh, for people who weren't used to democratic life, it was, of course, uh, a troublesome uh, picture they entered. So this was the uh, situation uh, in the world for the last uh, two, three decades. And I, I, I would also like to uh, uh, share with you what Turkey did during the 20, 30 years. Uh, so that uh, we can fit uh, Turkey into all these developments. Turkey, uh, from the proclamation of the republic, uh, had a, an economy which was purely state-controlled. At a later stage, uh, we had a, what we call a, a mixed uh, economy, where actually state was there, but the image was uh, because newly state enterprises were created, it was introduced as if those state-controlled enterprises were uh, free market uh, institutions. But for another two, three decades, we, we, we had a mixed economy. But practically, the uh, private sector was uh, limited because uh, the uh, export-import system was uh, based on limitation of imports. Uh, everything was prohibited. Uh, there was a list, uh, I mean, pages, 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 mentioning things which couldn't be imported to Turkey. And practically, uh, everything was, uh, was uh, limited. So then we had the... Uh, uh, Prime Minister Özal period in the uh, beginning of the 80s. And uh, a good friend of Japan, he took a lot of examples from Japan. And uh, he tried to uh, free everything and just mention what is not free. Just turning the, uh, the, the shape uh, upside down. So he issued a list of prohibited items, which was four, five, ten. Uh, and everything was, uh, was uh, free. This brought us to a, a free market economy, a liberal economy, and free entrepreneurship was uh, suddenly introduced to the Turkish uh, life. And uh, when we were exporting four articles, cotton, nuts, uh, figs, and tobacco and earning two and a half billion dollars, suddenly we went up to 8,000 articles and the exportation was uh, much higher. And of course, <coughs> uh, Turkey started uh, to, uh, to examine a different life. But <coughs> when you say free in front of anything, of course, that free freedom and uh, free entrepreneurship also brought some necessities for liberal free de democracy. We had democracy, but liberal democracy is uh, something much different than, than, than democracy. Uh, I, I worked uh, 11 years of my previous life uh, as a diplomat in the Turkish reform process. And somebody in 2000, year 2000, said to me, when Turkey is going to have a liberal democracy, and there was a reaction from me. I said, look, we have democracy. What are you talking about? What is liberal democracy? You're creating new obstacles, new, new barriers by mentioning new terminology. And then he sent me, we didn't have internet at that time, or Google. He sent me some references to uh, books. And I was ashamed, seeing that there's a huge road between democracy and liberal democracy. And actually, uh, when we started the European Union membership process, that was the part we had to uh, fulfill. We changed two-thirds of the Constitution, about more than 100 laws, changed the penal code, civil code, associations law, trade uh, law. Almost every law was, not articles were changed, we had new uh, laws instead. And I think, uh, the, because of those uh, changes, the, uh, the country is now uh, more liberal 
in economy and more liberal in democracy and freedoms and freedom of thought and demonstration and many other things have been really improved. And we're trying to become members of the European Union to the, because of those political reforms. But what Özal couldn't do was, was the, he did the economic part, changed the structures, but the democratic reforms, the political reforms, he couldn't do. And that was done during the last 10 years uh, under this uh, existing government's uh, governorship. And uh, uh, we, can, we can now talk about uh, a Turkey where we have uh, a market economy and uh, a European Union uh, accepted uh, political criteria adherence. Uh, during the last 10 years, when the, the world was facing the uh, earthquakes I have mentioned, especially the first three earthquakes, the collapse of Soviet Union, the uh, terrorist attacks, and the economic disaster, Turkey really did well. And uh, because of the uh, correct economic policies, and because we had a banking crisis in 2000, where all our banking system uh, almost collapsed. And just to give you an example, wrong decisions, wrong political decisions affecting economy was, was valid in Turkey. In 1998, there was signs that some banks were going to the wrong direction. And the government at that time couldn't afford taking the risk of declaring them bankrupt. If it was the case, we could have lost two banks, and it would have costed Turkey two and a half billion dollars. But because the decision couldn't have been taken in 98, the whole banking system collapsed. We, it costed us $50 billion instead of $2.5 billion. But because of sometimes from evil you get good things, what happened in 2000, Turkey restructured the whole banking system. And alarms were established. Any bank couldn't do what they did in the, eight, in, in the um, uh, 1990s. And uh, because of that uh, measures, when the world was facing the economic crisis, uh, deriving from the uh, banking system, Turkey had already uh, restructured its economy and uh, banking system so that when the world was hit, Turkey came out from the crisis even with a better economy and a better uh, welfare. So when you look at the uh, economic figures, uh, in 2003, Turkey was a country of uh, $300 billion national income-wise. Per capita income was $3,000. Our uh, tourism revenues were about 9 to $10 billion. Our exportation was something like $50 billion. And after the crisis, after, uh, I mean, if you look at the figures today, Turkey is a country, $820 billion, coming up from $300 billion. It's almost tripled. Uh, per capita income was $3,000. Now it is over $10,000 per, per person. The uh, exportation was $50 billion. Now it's $150 billion. And the tourism revenues is over... 30 billion dollars. So everything was tripled. And uh, when we, if we had talked about these figures 10 years ago, many people would have said, well, you are lunatics. You, you can't do this. You are lying to us. But it has been achieved. So now we're talking about, by the 100th anniversary of the proclamation of the Republic uh, in 2023, we're, we will double these figures, which was tripled uh, in 10 years, which means we are heading to uh, uh, $25,000 per capita income to 
trillion dollars of a national income, five hundred dollars, five hundred billion dollars of exportations, fifty billion dollars of tourism revenues. So Turkey will be almost five times bigger than what it was ten years ago. So, and this wasn't expected in Turkey or in the world. And uh, when Turkey came to that level, it gave Turkey some responsibilities as well. When you have problems in the region we are living, and when there are people who are really suffering from, from the earthquakes I have mentioned, they were looking to Turkey as an example, especially after the uh, Arab Spring or the Middle East uh, political transformation process. They said, OK, Turkey has done it. It's a country uh, secular, but 99% uh, of the population is Muslim. So if they, can, they could have done it, let us do it as well. Of course, it's difficult. It took perhaps generations in Turkey to come to that level. But we, we opened our hands, arms to them, uh, not to become big brothers, but to just be an example. If they want, OK. If they want to change the constitution, OK. We, are, we, have, we have done it. We have done it this way. You can experience from that. If you don't want, you can take the German example or whichever example you want. But normally, uh, Turkey became an example. And uh, not only in problematic times, but also countries who didn't suffer during the Arab Spring, uh, when they were facing a, uh, a, a wind to make some reforms, or they will face the same difficulty some of the leaders faced, uh, they, they also uh, became our <coughs> partners in a way. So uh, this also brought some responsibilities for Turkey, not only be existent in the region, but to use the soft power, the friendship, uh, in other parts of the world. For example, in, in Africa, uh, we really uh, made a lot of progress, and uh, we, uh, we opened uh, many, many embassies there. We had only a few embassies, but uh, the uh, uh, number of embassies went up to, uh, uh, where is it, from 10 to 27, for example. And uh, also the African countries uh, started opening embassies in Turkey as well. What was the result? Our trade with Africa, for example, was $9 billion when we initiated the new approach African uh, countries. And it, it is now $23 billion. So it shows that when you have embassies, when you have good relations, your intention is uh, only to uh, have uh, strategic partnerships, uh, friendships. Uh, there are benefits for both sides. The same thing happened in Latin America and Caribbean. So we had five, uh, we opened new five embassies, and it is now 12 altogether. And again, if you look at the uh, uh, figures, it's the same thing. In the uh, Asia Pacific region, same thing happened. We, ha we opened embassies in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, uh, Brunei, and Cambodia in the last two years. Uh, it's just to have uh, better relations and uh, to really, uh, uh, in a way, fulfill the responsibilities put on our shoulders because of the reasons I have mentioned to you. In many cases, when there are problems around the world, Turkey is asked to med uh, mediate in between Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey is mediating, between Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina, Turkey is mediating, between Bosnia and Serbia, Turkey is me mediating. So really, they trust uh, the Turkish positions, and uh, we are doing it. And it became so successful that the UN took this mediator's uh, idea. We now have a UN-sponsored uh, or UN-supported uh, mediation uh, club, and many countries are member to this. So this is uh, 
the world and Turkey. And now perhaps let me come to the uh, issue uh, I am mostly supposed to talk. The Syria crisis. Uh, why it didn't uh, follow the same river the other countries were uh, floating, uh, and why are we still living with a difficult situation in Syria? I think the uh, three countries, Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, uh, when they faced the, the, the spring and uh, their leaders were changed, uh, the elements in those events in the three countries were much different than the realities of Syria. What was different, uh, we can mention first of all, uh, the Russian uh, element. And this is, I think, one of the main elements why we still have the Syrian conflict with us. Russia is, uh, because of the first earthquake, Russia wants to prove that it is a power and wherever it finds, uh, it uses uh, the possibility to, uh, to make people understand this, this power. Uh, either it's the UN Security Council or situations like Syria or wherever. So Russia has, uh, for 300 years, had a uh, historical target to reach to the warm waters, as it was mentioned in, in the Russian uh, strategies, even during the Char time. And the warm waters is Mediterranean. Uh, the first warm water is Black Sea, where they have the, their navy there, because all the other uh, sea they have is uh, in the north and ice and uh, not usable throughout the year. and in in urgent uh, times, uh, you can't bring your fleet from northern uh, pole to the uh, warm water. So during the Ottoman period, during the Char period, they had the uh, wish to reach the warm waters, the Mediterranean. In Syria, now they have accomplished this wish, which was there with them for 300 years. They have a wonderful naval uh, military base in Syria. It is well situated uh, in the balcony. It, they, they see the Mediterranean very close to the uh, potential natural gas reserves. And uh, their fleet is in the Mediterranean. Secondly, the Soviet Union was able to sell arms uh, easily because they had uh, control over many countries politically. Leadership was controlled. So they just sell, sold the arms. And uh, nobody cared whether the Russian technology is compatible with, with other technologies. They just, they just had to buy. Uh, but in, in today's world, when Soviet Union is not there, Russia has lost a lot of political influence as well. So if you count the countries Russia has influence, it's, very, it's, just, it's not as much. So then they have to sell arms by entering into tenders. And then there's a competition. The US or Western technology, the Western technology is, I mean, incompatible with the Russian technology. So they, they aren't able to sell arms. In Syria, it's one of the countries they have a possibility to sell arms. It's not just selling arms. The whole Syrian military system is based on uh, Russian technology planes, uh, missiles, uh, tanks, battleships, uh, anti-aircraft, everything is Russian. The military is trained under the Russian system. So they wouldn't like to lose the wonderful uh, uh, possibility there. And Russia doesn't have much to export either. I mean, they have natural gas, oil, and arms, uh, and a few other things. But arms exportation is an important element for Russia to, to continue. So. When things in Russia happened, uh, things in Syria happened, we had the Russian interests conflicting with the need to change. And the third was, of course, the political leadership, the Ba'at party, was a creation of, in a way, the Russian ideology, and they were there. And they blocked, uh, starting uh, with the uh, uh, 
uh, UN Security Council attempts, uh, anything, any peace uh, possibility in Syria. Uh, the second element in Syria was, uh, of course, the, the Baad Party uh, strength. Uh, if you remember, two very strong leaders, Syrian leader Hafez al-Assad and Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein, when their nose were I mean, up and they wouldn't uh, uh, be sympathetic to any, any, any country or any, any people in the world, they, they agreed to join the Iraqi and Syrian Ba'ath parties, which was revolutionary, under the leadership of a Syrian Christian, Michel Eflak. So Assad and Saddam accepting to live under a Ba'ath party, joint Ba'ath party rule, shows how important Ba'ath party is, more than the country interests, more than the leadership's interests. Syria, the Ba'ath Party was there, and it was controlled by the father first, and then the son came. And actually, there are two families in Syria. One is the son's mother's family, and the other is the son's father's family, which controls the whole situation in Syria. So any attempt to uh, reform Syria, uh, to make Syria more democratic, was uh, taught by these two families who control and the Ba'ath Party thinking that it will be a danger for what they have earned economically and what they have earned politically. So they said, son, you do what your father did. That's the best thing for Syria. You shouldn't listen to what Turkey is saying, what Western world is saying, what, what uh, anybody is saying, but follow your father. Uh, continue with the Muhabarat, uh, no democracy, no opposition, no freedoms, we can survive like that. And he, he accepted that. He could have been a respected leader if he had, for example, uh, gone to the television and said, look, Syrian people, I'm your president. I know that uh, you want a change. I will change the constitution. I will change this prime minister. I will make some reforms. The Jordanian king did that. He went to the television. He said he will do these. Perhaps he didn't do much of these. But uh, Jordan came out from this uh, situation because they trusted their king. And he, he gave them the message the, the, the people wanted to hear from their leaders. In Syria, he couldn't do that. We tried to explain to him that, look, you're, you're endangered. You're, you're going to lose your leadership. Why don't you just uh, do some uh, reforms? Announce it. Because we had uh, some access to the, uh, uh, to the sun. Uh, with, with Turkey and Syria, we had difficult periods. Because in 1936, a part of uh, Turkey, uh, the Antioch, uh, in a UN plebiscite, <coughs> decided to join Turkey. And Syria was never, Syria never accepted this. And from 1936 onwards, they, they had some difficulty with, with, with in Turkish-Syrian relations. And in, in the Syrian maps, Antioch, Hatay, was never shown as a Turkish territory. Even today, it's, when you look at a Syrian printed map, you'll see that that part is a Syrian territory, even though it was a plebiscite and UN accepted uh, situation. Secondly, we have two rivers coming out from Turkey, the Tigris and Euphrates, which uh, the, the, the Euphrates passes Syria, joins Tigris in Iraq, and that's where we call the Mesopotamia. And they were afraid that Turkey one day will cut the water, and then we, will, uh, we won't have water, our agriculture will go bad, and, uh, but Turkey didn't have that intention at all. We were constructing dams, but giving water more than they even imagined. And we're still doing the same thing. So <coughs> they uh, normally played the, uh, the Russian-style diplomatic game. You know, the Russians are best players of chess. Uh, they play the Russian chess game very well. They play it everywhere. 
uh, in a restaurant or in diplomacy or in politics. So you have the Russian chess game in front of you. And the Russians are playing the chess game in order to force you to, to, to play the Russian roulette. Normally they want to give the pistol to you and uh, you try the, your luck. So in, that's how the uh, Russian uh, mentality influenced Syria as well. And uh, uh, they, they wanted to show every card they have. We, have, we were suffering from terrorism. We lost 30,000 lives uh, at a period where the leader of the terrorist organization lived in Damascus for 20 years. We were giving the addresses, his telephone number, and each time we, uh, we met again, uh, we were giving new addresses, new telephone numbers, but they said, he's not here, he's not here, but he was there for 20 years. So when the father died, <coughs> even though we lived all these difficult years, we said, let's give a chance to the new, new leader. Because he, was, he, he lived in, the, in Europe. Uh, he re respirated the uh, freedoms. He knew what a democracy is. So we said, he might be a person uh, we can come out from this difficulty. And really, it worked fine. Uh, we had uh, very good relations with uh, Beshar. And uh, I was uh, ambassador, permanent representative to the European Union at that time. And European Union criticized Turkey, saying that you're a neg negotiating country. What are you doing with Syria? You shouldn't have good relations with Syria. But we continued. And after a while, the same people who criticized Turkey uh, from, uh, through me uh, said, OK, you're doing fine. Uh, I think we have to uh, reconsider our policies uh, with Syria. But what changed uh, the whole situation was, of course, the Arab Spring. If we didn't have the Arab Spring, Turkey and Syria would have lived a wonderful uh, period. But uh, when leaders uh, lost their lives or disappeared from the scene, Assad was afraid, the family intervened, and so Syria was there. In the beginning, the the Syrian crisis uh, or the problem was much easier to solve because we had the Syrian regime fighting against the opposition forces. Now, if you look at the situation, we have Hezbollah with the uh, regime forces. We have uh, many elements uh, joined the uh, opposition forces. Nobody knows who is who there. Uh, when, I mean, when terrorist groups find a platform where they can continue their training, show their power, they immediately go there. They found Afghanistan once upon a time. Now they have uh, found that Syria is a wonderful platform. So you can see their names, what they have done, how many people they killed, and, and it's a catastrophe. And what Bashar Assad is doing now is even a more dangerous situation because uh, he has a B plan, which is that he almost completed the ethnic cleansing in the uh, western uh, part of Syria, uh, that is the seaside. And he wants to, in a difficult situation, wants to give up the whole Syria and uh, go to the part where ethnically cleansed he will have a smaller but uh, better, from his terminology, Syria for him. This is dangerous because then you will have the remaining part of Syria, which will become a platform for terrorism, for not only to attack uh, neighboring countries, but they can use that platform that, as they used Afghanistan platform to hit uh, Japan or United States or Western world again. So this is a very dangerous station. But the good news is I think Russia is also frightened by this uh, plan, B plan, because in this plan they might lose the uh, naval base they already have, and the military uh, flow of uh, arms uh, might be endangered, uh, it might be limited. So now, under the existing circumstances, it looks like 
we might live with with the Syrian crisis for a for some some more some more years ahead. Why? Because uh, the Western world, which normally had some influence in the change, for example, in Libya, uh, now uh, doesn't have that interest anymore. First, because there's no oil in Syria, so the oil companies wouldn't put pressure on the political decision-making system to uh, make some moves in Syria. Secondly, uh, because of the reasons I mentioned, the United States is, is not anymore uh, ready to send troops abroad. NATO is, because of the US, is in a, in a way handcuffed. And European Union is uh, having its own problems. Uh, they couldn't even form the uh, EU, EU army, which was supposed to be formed, 60,000 soldiers. And uh, therefore, it looks like uh, uh, if Russia is not convinced, if Russia is not given the guarantee that the three interests, naval base, selling of arms, and a political person, Russia can live together, is maintained, and this guarantee is given, I don't think Russia Syrian crisis will be able to uh, be solved. So the element is uh, to work on Russia and uh, to find a solution in a way for the transformation. What happened, uh, uh, what Turkey has done is it's our neighbor. It's uh, more difficult when you have a neighbor in difficulty. Uh, it was, of course, uh, an earthquake in Egypt, Tunisia or Libya, but they weren't our neighbors. So once the problem started in Syria, we were we were the first country to be uh, negatively affected. And when uh, Assad started bombing or killing his own people, uh, many of them started escaping from, from the horrible situation. And they're now in Turkey. We have about uh, 800, 900,000. We don't call them refugees, but we, we consider them our guests. But it is a big burden uh, in the region they live. We have established camps for them. It's very costly. We spend about $2 billion up to now. And the uh, uh, Western world uh, contribution is less than $100 million, which is uh, really a growing burden. Jordan <coughs> is uh, receiving some uh, refugees, uh, Lebanon and uh, Iraq as well. So this is going to be a difficult situation for all of us. So what we have done was uh, try to bring countries together who think that there should be an end to the Syrian conflict. And Turkey started this. Many countries joined Turkey. We have a Friends of uh, Syria group now. And among that group, we have a nucleus uh, group where 11 countries are present. Uh, they are having meetings. We are trying to... Uh, support the opposition because there was no opposition. In, in Egypt, for example, there was an opposition. Even though there was a dictatorship, there were parties, there were internationally known figures who were present in the everyday life. Uh, in Tunisia, they immediately uh, found people who could uh, take over from the dictators. There was a French uh, cultural influence. And Libya, it's a tribal system where Normally, the coalition of tribes found a political leadership. But in Syria, uh, there was no opposition, no figures who can replace uh, the existing regime. So we're trying to find people who can take over from, if there's a change, from Assad to, to bring Syria to a <coughs> democratic and uh, peaceful country. And uh, unfortunately, up to now, these efforts uh, didn't give any uh, <coughs> any concrete results. So if I may come to the uh, developments in Ukraine, I think uh, uh, Ukraine will be uh, a difficult situation uh, for, for the coming years as well, because uh, the composure of Ukraine is, uh, is uh, if you look at the uh, the population uh, uh, characteristics, 
you will see that there is a part of Ukraine, especially in the east and uh, in the Black Sea coast, where it is uh, more Russian populated. And when you look at the other part of the map, you will see that there are what they call the Ukrainian populated. And it's difficult to speak in front of an ambassador who came from Kiev, but please correct me if I make mistakes. So the, what is the difference between a Russian-Ukrainian and an Ukrainian-Ukrainian? It is uh, obvious. The Ukrainian-Ukrainians are Catholic, and the Russian-Ukrainians are Orthodox, which makes life, uh, some of them are. There's a wrong, wrong remark there. But uh, it is one of the elements there. Uh, so, and Russia, of course, has its navy in the Black Sea, uh, rented from Ukraine from, from uh, some years ago, which is the Crimean area, Sevastopol. And this, uh, when these incidents took place, uh, it was a kind of a reaction from Russia to, uh, first of all, guarantee that the Russian navy is secure. Uh, and sometimes uh, when it's a pendulum, the pendulum goes more than the the uh, bottom point, so uh, to guarantee the uh, Russian Navy, uh, Crimea is now d deciding to become Russian territory. And there's a difficulty in the eastern part of Ukraine as well. Uh, some tendencies are giving uh, similar examples uh, what happened in Crimea. Of course, what happened in Georgia actually uh, gave some examples for the future. Uh, when a country who is uh, making an attempt to uh, challenge the Russian interests, uh, it happened in Georgia, the Western countries, in a way, uh, gave some uh, messages to the, uh, at that time, the uh, Georgian president, who told that whatever he will do, uh, Europe will be with them or Western world will be with him. And unfortunately, when the Russian troops came in and divided the country into three, uh, nobody was there. I think same thing, similar thing, reminded me uh, when things started in Kiev. I was uh, very much afraid that uh, uh, the, the Ukrainian people who really started this process, to, uh, made, and they made their choice to be with with the European Union and not with Russia, uh, thought that at a certain stage uh, Europe will be with them, economically, uh, politically, whatever. But when they thought they won the battle, they overthrew the uh, president and president flew. Uh, actually, uh, the worst uh, situation started for them. They saw that other than economic uh, aid, uh, nobody will be with the Ukrainian people, so they have to handle their difficulty uh, by themselves. So now, when they are facing a situation when eastern territories are uh, threatened, uh, some messages are coming. But uh, nothing else is, uh, is uh, going to be with the Ukraine. Uh, it is a difficult situation because in our region, Russia is a reality. And natural gas is another reality. Uh, Russia is a big market. And many countries have uh, uh, companies working there, uh, contributing to countries, economies. That is a reality. And uh, to uh, have bad relations with Russia is, is not any country would, would like. Uh, country interests are uh, more realistic than uh, sentimental uh, feelings. So, for example, European Union hand is tied because of Germany, for example. I mean, Germany has uh, 8,000 companies in Russia. Or, many interests, and natural gas is coming there. And because of Germany, I don't think European Union can make decisions to, uh, to go further than some sanctions, which are very symbolic. I mean, freezing uh, some money of Ukrainian leaders or Soviet advisors, 
is not what was expected, if I may say so. And uh, this winter, the Russian chess game will be more visible because uh, many of the uh, uh, gas is passing through Ukraine and uh, they have uh, promised Ukraine to give gas at a very lower price, but after these incidents they will double it or triple it or not even give it. But not giving is also will affect the other countries who are dependent on, on the pipelines passing through Ukraine. So it's a very delicate situation. Many countries are considering their own interests and also the uh, world uh, uh, understanding that countries should have more freedoms, more democracy. Ukrainian people should have also more democracy, more liberalization. But when it comes to the implementation of these wonderful ideas, then you have to look at this realistic picture as well. So. Uh, we, we think that uh, what we can do is uh, try to uh, talk to both parties and uh, there are countries who have good relations with Russia. One is Turkey. We have uh, common interests. We are getting natural gas. Our companies are investing there and uh, we have good relations uh, between our the present Putin and uh, Prime Minister are, have a, a established a good body language. There's uh, electricity between them. We might have a chance to talk to the Russians. We are very good friends of the Ukrainians. We can talk to them as well. But the other countries have to do it. And unless we find a political uh, situation based on soft power, we might face a very difficult uh, picture in Ukraine as well. So let me stop here. I thank you for being so patient to listen to me. Uh, but I will give the floor to question askers. And uh, so that I will be very happy to see some, hear some criticisms. And I will try to understand what the feelings are in Japan vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world uh, events, uh, what's, what's going on in Syria what you think about Turkey's positions, what's going on in Ukraine. I'll be bringing back your pulse to, to my country. Thank you very much. Martin.